Hello, and welcome to episode 3 of Sarastro's Descent painting series. In this video, we'll be painting Averick Albright from Fantasy Flight Games Descent Journeys in the Dark 2nd Edition. Averick is both a righteous warrior and a valuable healer. His gleaming armour, vivid robes, and decorative details make him a satisfying figure to paint. In this tutorial, we're going to explore how, instead of highlighting up, we can glaze down to produce nice smooth transitions on the cloth. Here's an overview of the steps I'll be using to paint Averick Albright. As with all of the base set heroes, I've chosen to prime Averick with a white primer. We'll then paint on the base colours for all of the main areas of the miniature, apart from a few decorative elements. Next, we're going to provide a shade for the armour and for the yellow and brown parts of the miniature. We will then shade the shadows on the cloak with a series of glazes. And then carefully highlight the miniature, building up the contrast. Finally, we'll paint the remaining details, including the emblem on the shield, and the decorative trim on the clothes. Let's begin with the base colours. I'm going to begin by giving Averick's skin a base coat of Bugman's Glow. As usual, I like to use an older brush to transfer some paint and mix in a few drops of water. Next, I'm going to use some XV88 for Avric's hair. When painting a miniature that's been primed in white, it's all the more important that we get the brush right into all of the nooks and recesses. I'm also using this for the belt. I'm now going to paint the weapon and armour using a mix of around 3 parts Stormhost Silver and 1 part Celestra Grey. The main reason I'm mixing in the grey is that I want to dull the metallic reflectivity a little, so that when I later apply some pure silver as a selective highlight, it will stand out a little more. I'm now going to use some Temple Guard Blue for all of the blue areas. We're going to be painting the trim much later on, so we don't need to worry too much about going over it for now. Next, I'm using some Steel Legion Drab for the gap between the armour on the abdomen. And I'm using some Storm Vermin Fur for the shield handle and the tiny patch just above the left leg armour. Finally, I'm painting all of the yellow areas with some Avalon Sunset, apart from the shield emblem which I'll be painting later on.
We can also carefully pick out the belt buckle and belt tip with this. Once we're happy with the base colours, we're ready to do some shading. I'm going to provide two different shades to the model, starting with some Agrax Earthshade mixed with some Cassandora Yellow in a roughly 3 to 1 ratio. I'm then applying this to all of the yellow and brown areas. What I want to see here is a small amount of the shade settling into the grooves, helping to add definition. I'm not too worried if some of this gets onto the blue area, since it will be easy enough to touch up in a moment. I'm then going to shade all of the metalwork with a mix of roughly equal quantities of non oil with medium, with a touch of Drukii Violet. The only non metal part I'm shading with this is the handle of the spiked club. Once it's dry, I'm going to add a couple more layers to darken select areas further, notably the shield, which I want to give the impression of being lit from one side, so I'm going to add a couple of additional layers to the left side only. And I'm doing the same on some of the recessed parts of the armour also. Three or so layers of this on the shield should give us a nice level of contrast. I would also like a gradient on the back of the neck armour. We'll be adding some highlights here later on, but for now we're going to neaten up some areas of the blue cloth before moving on to the glazing stage. We're now going to begin darkening the shadows on the coat by glazing the area down, firstly with some Sotec green, followed by some Stegodon scale green for the darkest shadows. A glaze is simply a very thinned paint. When trying glazes out, it's a good idea to have a spare bit of scenery, or even just some primed clamshell packaging, to test your glazes out on. That way you can test the effect that using different strengths of glaze has. For our first glaze, I'm using a size 2 brush to draw 5 brushfuls of water into the palette. I'm then going to mix this with almost a full brush of paint. I'm then going to draw some glaze into the brush, but unload a fair bit onto some paper to prevent us from flooding the miniature. We can now brush this onto the shadowed parts of the miniature, which will initially mean all but the very brightest areas of the coat and I'm focusing just on the rear section for now. There are two simple things to avoid here. Firstly, we want to avoid letting the glaze pool anywhere, 
and unloading excess from the brush before applying helps with this. And secondly, we make sure that one layer is dry before applying the next. You may initially notice little or no difference, but after two or three layers, you will begin to see the shadows taking form. You can see that I've chosen the brightest parts to be the top of the backside, the raised ridges in the fabric, and the top of the back. The process may seem laborious at first, but such thin layers do dry pretty quickly, especially if you have a fan nearby, and you'll find soon enough that you have maxed out the tone and managed to produce a pleasingly smooth transition, in a way that would be arguably more difficult to achieve with highlights. We should naturally focus our application more and more into the deeper recesses as we add additional layers, a bit like when we highlight, but in reverse. An easy way to check that you've reached maximum depth is to simply take a dab of Sotec Green and apply a small stroke into the shadows. Here we can see that we have indeed achieved maximum saturation, and we're ready for the darker glaze. So now I'm going to repeat the process with some Stegadon Scale Green. I'm once again using five full brushes of water, but with perhaps a little less paint on my brush this time, since this is quite a big step up in darkness. If you'd rather not use the glazing approach, you could of course build the highlights up from dark to light in the usual way. For large, flattish areas like this however, you may find smooth transitions easier to achieve using glazes, and it's worth trying at least once, so you have another technique to draw upon when needed. We will be applying a few small highlights here later on, but for now, having modelled the process on the back of the robe, I'm going to provide shadows for the remaining areas. For smaller areas like these, we could use a heavier glaze by mixing in some additional paint and applying fewer layers. I might even mix in a little black to really push the depth in the deepest recesses. Once we've achieved a good level of depth in the shadows, we're ready to add some highlights. I'm now going to provide a few small highlights for the blue areas by lightening some Temple Guard blue with a little white. Next, I'm going to highlight the face, starting with some Cadian Flesh Tone. I'm carefully working my way around most of the face, leaving the creases and recesses untouched. And I'm now using some Kisler Flesh for the brighter highlights. I 
I might add a little white to push the highlights one step further. For the yellow areas, I'm going to begin with some Avalon Sunset. I'm also cleaning up any areas that got hit with the blue earlier. There's also a yellow trim on the tacit, which I didn't notice until later, but this would be a good time to paint it. For the yellow adornments, I'm going to add a final highlight with some Flash Gits Yellow. And for the trim on the robe, I'm using the warmer Uriel Yellow. For the trim on the pauldrons, I'm going to mix some Uriel Yellow with some Auric Armor Gold to give a subtle metallic sheen, although pure yellow would also be fine. We can also highlight the belt buckle with this. I'm then lightening this with a little white for the final highlight. I'm now going to highlight the metalwork with some pure Stormhost Silver. The highlights themselves want to be quite minimal. A few small touches on the most raised edges and details will bring a nice sparkle to the gleaming metalwork. I'm applying quite a thinned layer to the upper light half of the shield. And I'm picking out the central ridge and one or two additional details with a few small hits. These bright reflective glints play nicely against the slightly darker, more matte finish of the shield. We can also provide a little edge highlighting with this. I'm not trying to articulate every detail here, instead I'm taking a slightly loose impressionistic approach. With the highlights complete, we're ready for some finishing touches. We're now going to paint the trims on the clothes, and I'm going to begin by carefully applying a clean base of pure white. We 
can then use either black or a very dark grey to paint every alternate square marked around the edge of the overcoat. It's probably a good idea to work your way around in a single direction to avoid the possibility of ending up with two adjacent squares of the same colour. I'm then going to thin some non-oil with an equal measure of medium and use this to shade the entire lower trim. We want this to articulate the indented pattern as well as provide some additional depth in the shadowed areas. I'm then going to mix in a small dab of Stegadon Scale Green and use this to selectively shade the more shadowed white patches of the upper trim. You could of course paint a more opaque off-white over these patches instead of using a shade if you wish. I'm also going to further darken the shadowed parts of the lower trim with this. You might also want to add a few edge highlights to the black areas with some eshin grey. And I'm going to dab on a few white highlights to the brightest parts of the lower trim. With the trims complete, I'm now going to paint the emblem on the shield, using the same colours used for the other yellow and blue areas of the miniature. So for the blue sections, I'm starting with the base of Stegodon Scale Green. Followed with some Sotec Green. I'm then going to mix in some Temple Guard Blue and brighten up just the lighter half of the emblem. I might then just hit a couple of edges with some pure Temple Guard Blue. We can do the same for the yellow portions of the emblem, using the exact same colours that were used for the pauldrons. So here's the Avalon Sunset, followed by the Uriel Yellow and Auric Armour Gold mix. and now with a little white mixed in for the central ridge. There is some yellow ornamental tracery on the greaves, which we can also pick out with some Avalon Sunset. And these can be brightened up with some Uriel Yellow. For the metal studs found on each pauldron, I'm using some lead belcher. Followed with a small hit of Stormhost Silver. I 
I'm then going to mix a little Temple Guard blue into the silver and use this to approximate some of the metallic tracery we can see on the lower portion of each pauldron. These are only partially suggested in the sculpt, so we may have to make things up a bit. I would now like to do a bit more work on the face, starting with a thin blue glaze using some Drakenhof Nightshade mixed with four parts medium. I'm brushing this mostly onto the lower half of the face in a couple of layers, with the intention of cooling the tone and making things a little less pink. As this is the first of the heroes to have fully open and articulated eyes, you might like to have a go at painting them. To do so, we'll need an off-white, which you could create by mixing something like Screaming Skull with white, or by using a colour like Vallejo's Ivory. We then carefully paint in the whites of each eye. We can then use either black or mix a very dark grey for the iris and the pupil, or we could use something like Vallejo's German grey. A quick twist of the brush will help draw the paint to the tip and give us a nice point. If things go wrong, you could always reapply the white and start over. With the rest of the figure highlighted, I feel the face now looks a little dark, so I've chosen to brighten it up with a slightly wider application of Kislev Flesh. And I'm following that with a final highlight of Flayed One Flesh. Finally, I've chosen to give the hair a small highlight with some Talon sand, which you could also lighten with a little white if you wish. Once done, we can give the miniature a protective matte spray, and as usual, I will be rebasing the figure with a more scenic alternative, as described in episode 1. Because of the bumpy terrain, I am left with an awkward gap under the right foot. To disguise it, I'm going to stick on a tuft of sill floor grass. We simply dab on a little superglue and use some tweezers to press the tuft in place. I'm also going to stick some on the front of the base. And this completes Averick Albright. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, you can find details and links to all of the products and equipment used in this video in the description below. My huge thanks go out to my wonderful patrons for financing this work. Thanks to their generosity, I will now be able to produce a lot more videos for Descent in the coming months. Join me again soon as we continue painting miniatures from Descent Journeys in the Dark. Happy painting!